welcome to History Hack. If you didn't know by now, we are the revolution. That means we're sharp, witty, lots of fun, but it also means that we're essentially the peasants in Les Mis huddled round a table in the corner of the bar with no money. If you enjoy the show, please do support us. We have a Patreon account by which you can donate a small monthly sum in appreciation of what you're hearing. Alternatively, we have Ko-fi, in which you can just do a one-off donation as a thank you if you particularly enjoy a certain episode. Either way, we massively appreciate all of your support. Hope you enjoy the show. Hello and welcome to another exciting episode of History Hat. I've been left on my own again. I'm starting to think it might be my deodorant or something. But, <laughs> but I am joined today by another human being. I am joined by Peter James Bowman, who is a translator and historian who has written uh, many periodical articles and books. His other titles including Fortune Hunter, A German Prince in Regency England, and The Real Persuasion. And he's here to talk to us about his newest book, First Celebrities, Five Regency Portraits. So, Peter, how are you? I'm very well, thank you. Let's dive straight in. Celebrity culture in the 21st century is all too common. We've got, um, I mean, they're everywhere. You can't pick up a newspaper, turn on the news, open up the internet, even Twitter, with the latest celebrity news. But how would you define celebrity culture? And when did it first start to appear? Um, well, I think the key thing about celebrity culture is that nobody's in charge. You've got three elements to it. You've got the celebrity individual. Uh, who's motivated by um, love of attention, desire to make money, uh, the wish to uh, put across certain opinions and, and so forth. You've got the celebrity industry, which is a huge range of people from managers, agents, handlers of various sorts, to journalists, photographers, hairdressers, all sorts of people who have a vested interest in in uh, in the celebrity and in making the celebrity popular and remunerative. And then you've got the audience, the, the fans and other people who are interested in celebrities. And they have a role in shaping the celebrity as well because they have expectations uh, and needs from the celebrity. And uh, they make the celebrity act up to a certain sort of image. So you get this slight separation between the real person and the, and the public image. And that image is is generated in part by the desires of the audience. And the the odd thing about it is that, that all three of those elements are probably of equal importance. So there's a phenomenon going on that nobody's in control of. Oh, absolutely. And every now and then, um, like you said, you have like a, a public image and the private image. And every now and then you get the, uh, the public image flips and the private image can come through and it's um, yeah. it not be, they can be quite different. Uh, they can, yes, they, they can be. And then the, the audience, the audience or the fans react to that and they decide whether they want to, um, forgive this slip up, whatever it was, or they want to punish the celebrity. So the audience has a degree of power over the celebrity by being able to judge whether the celebrity has behaved in a good way or, or in a bad way. And from the side of the celebrity and the celebrity industry, they have to feed information to the audience about the celebrity, which has to be basically true about that person, but it isn't the whole truth. It's a sort of simplified version. And that creates all these tensions which can lead to unexpected things happening. Uh, I'm not going to name the uh, current American rapper and what he's been saying. But, uh, <laughs> but how, how did this start to appear in sort of the Georgian period? Well, there are, there are various ideas about when celebrity culture started, when it became recognisably what it is now. Some people say the start of film, some people say the start of television. But there's a sort of consensus that, that it started in the late 18th century and mainly in London. And it's a, it's a whole range of things, really. It's uh, things like uh, the growth of a capitalist economy, migration from the countryside to towns, um, and the opportunities that were opened up to people who are outside of the higher classes of society people started making a name for themselves and having opportunities. Education and literacy improved as well. It made all sorts of people able to um, gain prominence, you know, for very worthy reasons, but also for more frivolous reasons as well. And then there was, the, there was a free press as well with a lot of personal information, a lot of gossip, uh, the growth of images, paintings, engravings, uh, the, the popularity of portraiture, um, it's the great age of, of caricatures as well, satirical prints. And 
all these things, all these things together, um, together with an awareness on the side of the celebrities that they had to court public opinion and put out a certain image led to something which, although it's much simpler and much less immediate than modern celebrity culture, nevertheless has the same basic working parts. Um, and so it's, it's, it can be described as the, as, as the birth of, of, of celebrity. Before we get on to portraiture and caricatures, I wanted to start with poets, Byron and Shelley. How were they made celebrities by their writings? Well, at this at this sort of time, or well, throughout the 18th century, really, there was a, a move away from the patronage style of literature, where, where where writers didn't have to make money. They were either given state jobs or they had patrons to look after them, and publishing was on a very small scale, to a situation by the end of the 18th century where publishing was completely commercial as as it largely is now and so authors had to had to write for a living and in doing so it was in their interest to develop a sort of public persona people became interested in in who the person was holding the pen and um they um they started uh, putting themselves about more they gave lectures they appeared in literary salons a lot of criticism in reviews was was very biographical. Uh, this is the great age of periodical reviews, the late 18th and early 19th centuries. Um, a, lot, a lot of people started publishing memoirs about themselves and each other. And um, people became literary lions. You know, they were sought after. People would even try and find them out in their homes and sort of pick, peer at them. Um, so the, the, the writer as personality became established. And Lord Byron, I think, whom, whom you've just mentioned, was the most uh, the most striking example of that. Absolutely, his name still resonates today. Yeah, they are Byron and Shelley. Although, if you say Shelley, most people think of Mary Shelley, but um, <laughs> it, it is still very much in print and read now these days. Yes, and what Byron did, which was which was which took celebrity to another level, is that he modelled his heroes on himself the heroes of his of his poems. And then he started modelling himself on his heroes. So Byronic characters and Lord Byron himself became, um, you know, a, a little bit interchangeable. And people started reading the poems to find out about him. They became fascinated by him as a man. And they read his books to, to try and find out hints about his life and especially about his private life. Um, and then the, the, the publisher, John Murray, realised what a good formula this was. So he encouraged him to write more poems with the same sorts of heroes. Byron realised he was onto a good thing and started actually acting up a Byronic image, which didn't actually always suit him and wasn't really all that much like him in some ways. But he, but he, but he, but he um, encouraged rumours and, and tried to lead this sort of dissipated lifestyle and, and, and put, a, put out an image of being bored and, and, and cynical about everything. So uh, he be he became the ultimate celebrity writer. At the moment, we have quite a, a huge celebrity culture around actors. In the Regency period as well, this also sort of took off with uh, poets and actors becoming more and more famous as well, didn't it? It did, yeah. I mean, actors in some ways are natural celebrities because they're used to performing in front of an audience for a living. So the, the performative aspect of being a celebrity, you know, acting a certain way in public and living up to your image is something that they're already... Um, doing as part of their job. Um, the other aspect with the theatre is it's hard to overestimate uh, how important the theatre was then. I mean, a lot, lot of forms of public entertainment that exist now didn't exist then, and everybody went to the theatre. All classes of people went to the theatre. There were loads of strolling companies, companies of strolling players that went to tiny towns and even villages and performed in barns and above pubs and things, and the London theatres were the centre of fashionable and, and cultural life so people wanted to know who these actors were especially the most successful ones and because actors tended to play parts that suited them and somehow matched their personality whether it was sort of flirtatious chambermaids or grumpy old men or whatever people 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 wanted to um know if that's what the person really was like and so again you get this 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 connection between the, the 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 literature and the, and the and the reality you know between the the person that they were portraying on the stage and and the real person and people were very curious about actors and there was a huge amount about them in the in in the in the press and there were an awful lot of images of them bought and sold 
So there's not that much of a change from then to now in certain respects. There is a over fascination with, in my opinion, of, of uh, Hollywood actors and yes, yeah. But also in a society where women are mainly overlooked, what made Harriet, Duchess of St Albans' life stand out? Well, I suppose the, the origin of it was the, the two marriages that she made. She was an she was an actress, a sort of second tier actress, and she married a very successful banker that Thomas Coutts, the, the, the founder of the Coutts banking dynasty, so the, the an enormously wealthy and, and prominent person. And he he was seventy nine when they got married, and she was I think thirty seven. So, uh, but they you know they seemed to have a, a genuinely loving marriage. But he he was so adoring um and devoted to her that uh when he died he, he didn't just leave her all his money but he actually left her a controlling stake in in coot's bank in the strand so she was by far the wealthiest woman in britain and she was completely independent she had partners who ran the bank on a day-to-day -day basis but she played a part in it and she was so wealthy that she was presented with the question of what she should do with all this money. And what she did was become um, a sort of innovative party giver. She gave the best parties or the most extravagant parties. And she also made sure that she was in the papers all the time. Uh, she leaked information about what she was doing and the, the newspapers were always reporting where she was going, who she was meeting, um, what charities she'd given um, and, and so on. So she basically liked being in the public eye all the time and some people were interested in her some people resented this and then she married a, a, a duke uh, who was obviously interested in her money he was 20 years younger than her and that was that caused that caused a big stir as well and everywhere you looked you 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 you, you found information about this woman and the other thing about her is she she tried to wheedle her way into the the, the, the top ranks of society but she wasn't really accepted because of her origin she was from a very very simple background she was the daughter of a a, a wardrobe keeper in a in a company of of um, strolling actors so she was from a very poor background and she was never really accepted in society but she kept on trying by means of charitable giving and these parties that she had and constantly paying for her name to be in the papers to to break into society and that created a sort of public spectacle would she succeed or wouldn't she despite her being her best publicist would you say that the social class system was strong enough then to uh, i don't think strong enough is the right word but the, i don't think about how to put this in english that the class structure was so inwardly facing that it wouldn't still wasn't allowing people in no that that was that was part of it yes there was there was the fact that it was still fairly closed i mean there were ways in for people but uh, um, but yes, of course, they despised her for her origins. But the other thing was that she tried to do it on her own terms. Instead of completely um, fawning on, you know, the, the marchionesses and the duchesses and so on, she she tried to carry on being herself. And she would speak honestly about her origins, and she would have a certain sort of um, direct way about her, which people described as vulgarity. And she refused to change that. She was, she, she liked to telling stories about her past as a, as a, as a young actress, rising actress. She, she liked to have a joke. She liked to um, banter with people and she didn't want to change that. So she tried to sort of force her way through on, on her own terms and, and they weren't having it. Rather than playing the game, as it were. Yes. Another prominent woman that you, you talked about was uh, Princess Dorothea Levin. She goes on to play quite an important role in Anglo Russian diplomacy. But how how well known was her role? Well, initially, well, she she came to this country in 1812 as the wife of the Russian ambassador, um, and it became apparent very quickly that she was the real ambassador because her husband was a bit of a non-entity and she was much more intelligent than him. But in her first years in Britain, she was known as a leader of society. She wasn't known for political or diplomatic activity. She was known as a leader of society. She was extremely dignified and I suppose she had a sort of exotic aspect to her because she was Russian and there were very few foreigners in Britain at the time because of the Napoleonic Wars. Um, she dressed beautifully. She was very clever and witty. Um, people were slightly in awe of her. They didn't necessarily like her, but they were slightly fearful of her because she had a sharp tongue. And so she was, she was a social leader, really. And she was um, a patroness of the All Max Balls, which were the most fashionable balls that were held once a week in, in central London in Mayfair. And 
um, she obviously gave parties as the, as the ambassadress, which was what they called the wife of an ambassador then. And, um, she mixed with, in diplomatic circles. So she was, she was known as a high society figure. It was only later when she discovered her love of politics and meddling and, and, uh, and being a channel of information that, that people started to realize that she had more and more of a political position. And that was much more, much more problematic and people reacted much more negatively to that. But that, that, that wasn't the case until, um, about 10 years or so after she arrived. What, what kind of things was she getting involved in? Well, she became a sort of unofficial channel of information between governments. Um, and she became, for the Russians, she became a way of eliciting information, secret information about British political life and diplomatic activity. Uh, she had a very captivating manner and um, she was very um, responsive to uh the, the talk of political men. men men lived in a political men powerful men lived in a completely male world um and women were discouraged from even talking about politics because they would be accused of being blue stockings or um encroaching on a man's terrain so men lived in a completely male world in politics and it was quite a sort of fusty boring world really uh quite colorless and so when they encountered a woman who listened to them and understood them and praised them and was bright eyed and gave interesting responses, they were completely bowled over by her. They'd never had this before. And they they told her things that they shouldn't have told her. And she she sent all the information back to St. Petersburg. Um, and then she started having an affair with with Metternich, the Austrian chancellor. And Austria and Russia were very close because they were the two conservative powers. And, 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 and she sent, she started sending information to, to him as well. And some British political figures who were also very conservative and wanted to ally Britain with those countries and, and move away from more liberal countries, they started using her as a conduit as well. So she was, she was, um, somebody who was taking a position on the, on the British political scene too. And she developed this massive network of, of, of contacts. Oh, wow. So she was. She was really quite active. Oh yes, she was. She was. She was very active. And then, of course, as time went by, the general public and, and the press started realizing what was what was happening. They saw um, how much power she was wielding and how she'd um, broken the, the the rules in 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 the sense of women not being allowed to have anything to do with politics. And there was quite a lot of resentment about her as a as a as a, as a foreigner. Having all this influence over, over men. I mean, people like Lord Grey, the Duke of Wellington, they were always in her company and always telling her things that they shouldn't have been telling. And she tried to interfere by having her friends promoted in government. Uh, she tried to influence foreign policy. Uh, she became part of a sort of coterie around the king, uh, George the fourth, uh, who wanted to promote a certain line and was in opposition to the fairly liberal Prime Minister George Canning for a while in the 1820s, and and when this when this became apparent, the reaction was really furious uh, that this woman was was interfering. She even tried to interfere in internal British politics, you know, domestic politics. She was an opponent of the Reform Bill, or she was accused of being one. So, um, so so that's when things started getting sticky for her, when people realised that she was playing a, an unofficial political role. She was what they called a petticoat politician. That was the that was the term of abuse that was used. What, what, what happened to her in the end? In the end, it's a sort of story of, of addiction in a way, because she, she became so obsessed with politics, so addicted to it, that she was always intriguing for its own sake by the end. And, and she became too arrogant, uh, too pushy and too nosy as well. And she started losing her touch, you know, the old charm that she'd had and the way that she'd had of, of, of you know, playing men like a fiddle. That started to desert her. And she started getting a little bit too forceful. Um, and she was also a little bit triumphalist when things went right for her and went right for Russia. And in the end, she fell out with the Foreign Secretary, Lord Palmerston. And he engineered a very clever way of getting rid of her by appointing somebody to as ambassador to Russia that the Tsar couldn't accept. 
So the Tsar said, I can't accept this person. Please find somebody else. And Palmerston refused. And because Britain then had no ambassador in Russia, Russia, to maintain equivalence, had to withdraw its ambassador, which is um, Princess Levin's non-entity husband, uh, from from London. And, and, and that way she was expelled. So she, 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 she just went too far and offended too many people. That's, that's quite a genius move. <laughs> Moving on, I have to be careful. I'm going to trip over this because this is quite a mouthful of a name. So who was Richard Temple Bridges Chandos Grant Grenville? And why was he? does he become a favourite of the caricaturists? Well, in terms of his family background, he's basically the product of generations of very, very clever marriages, bringing, bringing estates together. And the, the estate he, he owned, which was centred on Stowe House in Buckinghamshire, which is a school now, um, uh, was, was, was really enormous. I mean, he had a vast income and he also owned about 11 MPs. In other words, he, he, he chose them, you know, the constituencies with very small, um, electorates where he was the landlord. He basically told people how to vote and they voted for his placement. And he had this faction in parliament that were called the Grenvilleites, Grenville being the family name. And he he manoeuvred them about and, and offered the, the, the two larger parties, the Whigs and the Tories, an alliance with his little group and became a sort of power broker. This is all in the pre-reform parliament after 1832 and the Reform Act, that this kind of thing wouldn't have been possible anymore. But uh, in, in, when he was when he was active, um, he 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 used his 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 faction and he did it in a, in a very um, cynical and selfish way that, that that earned him a lot of criticism um and and, it, and at the same time he tried to play the great grandee he tried to be like a feudal overlord in buckinghamshire where he was the great man of the county and had these four five day long parties with archery competitions and and oxen and pigs roasted whole and going like a sort of medieval pageant he had mm. and this sort of set him up as, as somebody that people would want to dislike. And when lots and lots of things went wrong for him, he, he had all sorts of mishaps in his personal life and he, he, he um, made a fool of himself in lots of ways. And he was also enormously fat. He became a sort of gift for um, caricaturists and uh, also writers who wanted to include him in, in works of fiction. And people sort of wanted to see him fall and he often did he made so many mistakes he was he was a, he was a little bit uh, insensitive towards other people and, and and in his in his private life he, he he made a fool of himself with women he even insulted one woman one woman who wouldn't have an affair with him and tried to blacken her name and then somebody challenged him to a duel um his son wanted to marry a famous courtesan uh, he fell out with the Royal Yacht Squadron, but carried on flying their pennant and was made a fool of for that. All sorts of things he he, he did wrong. And 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 when he was when he had a, a, a government position um, and it ended, he he took home all the stationery, all the pen and paper, and sealing wax, and that provided an endless subject of of jokes and of of, of satirical prints. As one of him. As, as called the fall of Icarus, where he's flying too close to the sun and his wings fall apart, and the wings are made of feathers for writing with, and they're, they're attached with sealing wax, and the wax melts, and he falls he falls to the ground, and so he was he was an absolute gift. He was a sort of larger than life buffoon. Were these publications like Punch magazine? Or the uh, that, yeah, well, that's a bit that's a bit later, but. The, yeah. the period that he was living in, and the period that I've written this book about, is the golden age of. Of, of the satirical prints, people like Crookshank and Heath and so on, Gilray. Um, and these, these prints were available for sale in shops, either, either as single items or, or together. And they were very popular. They were endlessly reproduced, sometimes hand colored. And people would sort of stare in at the windows of these shops that were selling them. And people knew all these prints. Um, and, there was a huge uh, readership of newspapers as well, where there were endless puns about him. I mean, they didn't seem very funny to us, but there were, there were constant punning. There was constant punning about him. Um, one that I can remember is he had he had an affair with a daughter of one of Napoleon's brothers, Letitia Bonaparte. She was called. She was a sort of a slightly louche figure who had affairs with various people. But he had an affair with her for a while, and uh, and. There were so, there were lots and lots of puns about them and things he'd said to her and and she'd supposed to have said to him 
And, and there was one I remember where she said to, to a friend, some are born great, um, some achieve greatness, and some have greatness thrust upon them with the idea that, you know, her lover, was this great big bulk of a man was sort of collapsing on top of her in bed or something. And these, these, these jokes were relayed, you know, from one paper to another because newspapers printed stuff straight from other newspapers without attribution. Um, so yeah, people just, people just, uh, love to laugh at him. I've got this image in my head now. <laughs> Sorry, yes. Uh, moving on to a much nicer image. I apologise for that. Yeah. Uh, uh, it's my fault. I, I never grew up past 17. And uh, <laughs> but moving on to a, a, a nicer image. Could an artist really do the beauty of Lady Charlotte Newry justice? Well, apparently not, If you to, to, to judge from what people said. I mean, the two most uh, esteemed portrait painters, John Hopner and Thomas Lawrence, both tried to paint pictures of her, and both of the pictures were considered to be failures, and quite bad failures. Uh, and Lawrence actually studied Lady Charlotte Berry at parties and, and tried to capture the way that her eyes were upturned sometimes and tried to capture the way she moved. And um, he, he, he failed in his attempt to, to paint her, and other people painted her, and, and, and nobody could do it. And people said that she was so beautiful that art actually couldn't capture her beauty, uh, which people theorised about. People said that she was so beautiful because she was the incarnation of nature. People said that she was the incarnation of the classical ideal of beauty um, and that her beauty was born of some kind of harmony of mind and body. People sort of said these extremely enthusiastic things about her. Um, and it was it, it just became a... a it just became an understood thing that it was impossible to put this on canvas. So did anyone actually manage to do uh, any kind of uh, justice or, did, or, or was it all just complete write-off? Do we, do we actually know how beautiful she was supposed to be? Was? Well, there aren't that many. The curious thing is, although she was considered the most beautiful woman of her generation, and lots and lots of people said that, um, there aren't many physical descriptions of her. She was... She she wasn't a, a fragile looking woman. She was tall and she was quite quite physically strong. She had a, 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 um, a sort of rose and cream complexion. She moved very beautifully. Apparently, she walked well. She had golden hair. Um, she, she probably wasn't um, somebody who was in in accord with modern ideas of beauty. It was an ideal of beauty more of that time in various ways. Um, but she was but she was strong. She was quite ath athletic. And she looked healthy, and that's it was that was that was the nature of of her of her beauty. And then you know this idea of her being a, a beauty like from classical antiquity, people comparing her with Roman vases and and uh, wall paintings and Herculaneum and things like this, that that um, fell together with a new fashion for uh, Roman style dress for women, the so-called Empire line of, of dress where women wear these very thin gauze like dresses which which are tied just below the bust so there's no waistline and then they fall freely to the the ground that was the that was the style that just came in in the 1790s and because she was considered to be a classical beauty and this classical style of dress came in which she became a, a lead you know a, 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 a leading part of you know some people even say she said she introduced it Every, everything everything seemed to to fall together everything was everything was natural and perfect moving on to thomas lawrence now it was probably not a name that people immediately recognize but you will have seen one of his paintings at some point when i was doing the research and i looked through i was like oh he painted that one of wellington he, he had quite an obscure origin but how did he overcome those to become the pictorial chronicler of the regency um well he, he overcame his obscure origins by being a child prodigy really um his father was an innkeeper in, at Devizes in Wiltshire and had quite a few children. But it became obvious by the time that Thomas Lawrence was about five that he was an infant prodigy. He could recite verses from memory, Milton and Shakespeare especially, and he could draw people's faces, which he was completely self-taught in that. He just, he just something he started doing. And so when guests came to stay in this um, inn and people, as they travelled across the country, they'd stay in inns in every town, um, including quite famous people. Lawrence, Lawrence's father would produce this little boy either to read, either to declaim poetry or, or to draw a likeness of the, of the guests. And he was such a beautiful child 
and he had such such natural grace of course you know that's that's what the report says and he was so clever and he was so engaging that everybody wanted to do things for him he was one of these people that everybody wants to do things for one woman wanted to adopt him the sister of the earl of warwick wanted to adopt him somebody else wanted to take him to london to show him around the art galleries another person offered to have him sent to italy to learn to to, to become an artist there uh, somebody else gave him gifts everybody wanted to do things for him and everybody wanted to claim that they'd had a part in in discovering him there was this there's this whole narrative of discovery that was going on and then his father who was a bit of a showman a bit of an impresario by nature and didn't want to work himself um after twice failing as an innkeeper he just sort of threw in the towel and stopped working he instead became his son's promoter and he took him to bath and, and 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 put adverts in the papers and and all the high society people like Georgiana Duchess of Devonshire and others wanted to have their wanted to have their um faces uh, sketched by him it became a sort of fashionable thing to do and it just it just went on from there everybody while he was a teenager as well everybody wanting to help him everybody wanting to push him forward um and then the the move to london obviously becoming established as an artist um and he 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 wore his he wore his origins very lightly. He never denied his origins. He didn't. He, he wasn't obsequious, um, but he had a sort of natural charm. A lot of self, a um, lot of self possession. He was a good listener. He was quite kind, and um, he, he just got on with the with the people he was with. He had a, a very agreeable, attractive manner, and he was a good looking man as well. So um, ev- everything everything was in his favour does kind of the opposite to Harriet Duchess of St Albans in that he whereas she openly spoke about her background he just he acknowledges it but just doesn't talk about it yes he's 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 very at ease with himself and sometimes people are amazed when they learn what his origins are because he, he everybody assumes that he's that he's a gentleman by birth um which is supposed to be this innate thing that people you know, had or didn't have um but he he was so elegant so refined so urbane uh, also, as I say, n- not pushing himself forward too much. He was quite reticent. Um, he let other people do the talking. He didn't tell a lot of jokes or anything. It just, it just, it just made him some somebody that people wanted to be with. Yeah. And obviously, that'd be combined with his great talent and his growing reputation as, as as an artist, which made him more and more established in society. And everybody wanted their portrait painted by him. So I know I've mentioned uh, Wellington already, and I know this is audio so you can't see it but uh the 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 very famous painting of wellington in his red in his military red coat is that one um but who else um what other uh major figures uh, were painted by him well he he painted all sorts of people whose names are forgotten now but he 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 also painted uh fame very famous people like sarah siddons the actress but he painted all the um senior politicians and Foreign heads of state, including the Pope and the and, and uh, the, the, the Pope's um, most important cardinal, uh, royalty in Austria. He went on a European tour from 1818 to 1820, sort of commissioned by George, by George the Fourth, um, or the Regent as he still was then, um, and produced what's, what's now called the Waterloo Gallery in Windsor Castle. All these pictures of people who were involved in the alliance against Napoleon, um, more or less directly. Um, so he, he's, he is the sort of, um, visual chronicler of, of, of his age. And he was, he, he was a fairly flattering artist, but without being too, too flattering in most cases. And, um, and as I say, he was, he was the, he, he charged the highest prices, which added to his, um, allure as well. And, um, he, he was the number one portraitist and, 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 uh, he painted. He painted all the all the leading European figures of the day. Uh, charging the most probably made his father quite happy. <laughs> yes, well, he, I mean, he 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 supported his parents, and in fact, he supported his his siblings. I mean, his 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 brothers and sisters never seemed to have quite enough money, and they also had lots of children. He never married, but his his, his he had siblings that he supported. He supported his parents. You know, he he completely funded their their household. Um, and he was a real, he loved his family very much. He, he never, he never had anything but praise and love for his own family. And, and he was, he was, he was the breadwinner for all of them. Um, he also gave a lot of money away. He, 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 it was, he was thought to be a bit of a gambler as well, which, which, um, got through a certain amount of money. But no, he was, uh, he was very generous to his family. 
if my daughter's listening to this, when you become rich and famous, uh, Daddy Bank is always open. <laughs> so I know you have to draw the line somewhere when you're writing the, the sort of books. But what made you choose these specific um, portraits and early celebrities? Um, well, I suppose it was partly that they were people I'd come across when I was in, uh, involved with earlier projects, people who people who'd caught my eye. Um, I wanted to have a range of people. I wanted to have men and women. I've got three women and two men. I wanted to have people from different walks of life. So you've got the theatre, you've got um, the London party scene, you've got diplomacy, you've got parliamentary politics, uh, you've got uh, the world of literature, you've got the world of fashion, clothes and fashion with Lady Charlotte Berry, who was a leader of fashion. You've got the world of art, obviously, with Thomas Lawrence. So you've got all these different... uh, You've got all these different spheres of life, which I also go into a bit. And I try and show that al- although all these spheres are different, the mechanisms of celebrity, including things like celebrity endorsements and press coverage and what have you, you know, work, work in the same way across all of them. Absolutely. And it, it does uh, flow very well together. It's really in, quite an interesting read. But is there anyone that you thought now, once once it had all gone off to the publishers and thought, oh, okay, maybe I should have put them in as well? Yeah, I mean, there are, there are, there are, there are other people. In fact, I've already made a list of, of another five or six people, or six it is. There are five in this book, but I've made a list of, of, of another group of people that I'd, I'd, I'd quite like to, to look at more. I mean, the, 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 the thing is that it's so easy now to read newspapers. That's what made this book possible with, with digital archives of newspapers. Um, I use the British newspaper archive. You can you can find information so easily because you can do word searches. Although they're scans, you can you can word search them. So you can really write a new kind of biography in a way, which is a biography of somebody's public image. You know, it's, it, it, a lot of biographies obviously concentrate on people's private lives and are based on letters and but you know personal statements and memoirs and things like this. And uh, there's, there's some there's quite a lot of that in in, in my book as well. But because of these newspaper archives and the way that you can just track somebody's image and track how they were talked about you can you, you can look at people in a in a new way and you could do this with, with lots of people i think the the availability of, of of newspaper archives online um is is you know something that's that's very exciting it's certainly exciting to me absolutely um so i do uh first world war stuff naval stuff and it, it's quite helpful for that as well getting you know, <laughs> people's opinions on things so yeah and I, I think the especially during covid where everything has sort of become more digitized it's, it's making the researchers job a lot more interesting and yes very easy. yes well it made i mean it made a big difference especially with with with, with lockdown because i couldn't go to archives i couldn't uh i couldn't travel about as much as i wanted to do especially at the towards the end when i was writing about thomas lawrence so I relied on archives sending me things. But yes, the fact that I could just sit here where I'm sitting now and just look at look at all these old newspapers um, on the screen in front of me and, 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 listen, and read all these puns, all these little anecdotes that were put in the papers about people. It was a real luxury. Absolutely. And as you said, it does give you a much more rounded uh, image of the people that you're writing about, especially with like we were saying it was celebrity you have the the actual person and then the image that they're um they're portraying yes um and you can you can really see you can really see the tensions between the two sometimes i mean as well as these five portraits my book has a long section about how celebrity culture works how it was born and then there's, there's a bit on the poets and a bit on actors and actresses and i, I know we touched on that but that's all separate from the the five uh set piece biographies and um it was very, it was very interesting to see how the, the workings of, of celebrity culture were were replicated across all those areas. Yeah, absolutely. I, I found it a very riveting read. Thank you. If you wouldn't mind uh, reminding everyone uh, what the title is and uh, where they can buy it. Well, the title is uh, the first celebrities five Regency portraits. It's going to be published on the fifteenth of January, and it'll be available in 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 bookshops. 
obviously on the Waterstones website and Amazon. And, and I will uh, I will have a word with uh, our powers that be. We have a, a, a History Hack online bookshop. So everyone, <laughs> uh, the money goes to the people who deserve it. <laughs> well, that sounds, that's, that sounds perfect. Yes, that sounds, that sounds very attractive. Absolutely. I, and then hopefully one day I can retire um, on my daughter's money. <laughs> yeah. But Peter, this has been really interesting. Thank you ever so much for coming on to talk to us about Georgian portrait, portraiture and biography. Well, thank you very much for, for inviting me. It's been, it's been a really enjoyable talk for me as well. Thank you. Our incredible guests give us 45 minutes of their time to join us and talk about their work or their new book. This is just a small taster. As a result, we have launched our very own bookshop on bookshop.org, where you can find our guests' latest books, you can support them, and you can support us on History Hack. 10% of every sale via our bookshop supports the podcast and allows us to keep going and bring you more top-of-the-line guests. You can find our bookshop at bookshop.org forward slash shop forward slash history hack or search for us in the shop section. Thank you so much for your continued support. We really appreciate our listeners and supporters. So make sure you get down to the bookshop and grab yourselves a new book.